Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Tacoma, Washington newspaper carried the story of Tattoo the Basset Hound. Tattoo didn't intend to go for an evening run, but when his owner shut the dog's leash in the car door and took off for a drive with Tattoo still outside the vehicle, he had no choice. Motorcycle officer Terry Filbert noticed the passing vehicle with something dragging behind it and running beside it. It was the Basset Hound picking up his feet and putting them down as fast as he could, he remarked. The officer chased the car to a stop. Tattoo was rescued, but not before the dog had reached speeds of 20 to 25 miles per hour, running and rolling over several times. The dog was fine, but asked not to go out for an evening walk for a very long time. <laughs> Many of us live like Tattoo, with our days marked by picking them up and putting them down as fast as we can. We are busy people. We move at a fast pace. We engage in many activities, commit to many obligations. We're afraid it's rude to set limits on our time. As a result, the to-do list never gets any shorter. It's easy to view interruptions then as distractions and hassles from real life when we're always in a hurry. But if we are so busy that we haven't the time for interruptions, then we may be missing some of God's best opportunities to serve Him. We get going in one direction for a very noble cause, and we feel that we can't stop or make time for anything else. In the account from Mark that we'll look at in this episode, we see the Lord is going in a, the direction of a very noble cause, to go to a young girl who was gravely ill. And yet our Lord was interruptible. He stopped and made time for a woman in need on the way. Likewise, sometimes we need to allow our busy lives to be interrupted to help others in need. Mark 5, 24 to 26 reads, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. The Lord with his disciples had just returned to the western shore of the Sea of Galilee after having been in Decapolis on the other side. When they arrived and stepped off the boat, a large crowd gathered around Christ on the shore. In the midst of this crowd stood two people, especially anxious to see him. Jairus, a synagogue ruler with a dying daughter, and an anonymous woman suffering from an incurable disease. After Christ stepped onto the shore, Jairus stepped forward and he fell at his feet. And Jairus passionately pleaded with the Lord and begged him that he would come into his house, Luke 8, 41 says, to help his dying daughter. Without a word, the Lord immediately set out for this man's house, and Jesus went with him, Mark 5, 24 says here. And as Christ went with Jairus, the crowd refused to be left behind. As the Lord went to Jairus' home, he did so against the crush of people surrounding him, moving in the middle of a mass of people pressing in on him as he walked. But on the way to Jairus' house, there was an interruption. Thus, the account shows that while Jairus approached the Lord first, it was the woman who was helped first. A woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years appears on the scene. We don't know her name, but we know her situation, and we see that her world was very dark. The nameless woman is described in detail. And we learn first that she had a perpetual issue of blood, a chronic bleeding problem, 
and she had this problem for as long as Jairus' daughter had been alive, 12 years. Scripture does not tell us what caused it. She was hemorrhaging, having a constant flow and loss of blood, bleeding from the womb. It sapped her of strength and left her tired and was obviously uncomfortable. And imagine having this issue of blood every day of your life for 12 years. That's 4,383 days, 624 weeks, 144 months. For 12 years, this woman had steadily grown weaker and her health deteriorated. Such a condition would be difficult for any woman of any era or time. But being a Jewess under the law, this was especially a problem because this made her ceremonially unclean. Leviticus 15 says this, According to the law, if an issue of blood extended many days, she was unclean all the days of the issue. This woman had an issue of blood for 12 years, and so she was unclean for 12 years. This continual flow of blood rendered her perpetually unclean, and an unclean person was not permitted to go to the synagogue or to the temple in Jerusalem. She was an outcast in Israel's spiritual life. This uncleanness did not allow her to take part in any aspect of Israel's worship. This malady kept her from participating in Jewish religious life, and it also left her so socially ostracized and prevented her from joining normal everyday activities. She could not have physical contact with other people. If she touched her husband, according to the law, he was unclean. If she touched her children, they were unclean. If she touched her friends, they were unclean. If she touched a stranger, they were unclean. So people avoided her and they refused to come near to avoid becoming ritually unclean themselves. The stigma and humiliation of her blood issue was perhaps second only to those of leprosy under the law, and it led her to live a separated, rejected, and ashamed life. This woman never was able to rise beyond this. For 12 years, she had no reprieve living on the periphery of society and shunned by all. Verse 26 shows her desperation and tells us that she had tried her hardest to be relieved of her problem. She had sought help from many doctors and had suffered many things of many physicians, we're told here. She had tried hard, her level best, to find a cure from multiple doctors, so hard that verse 26 says that she had spent all that she had, and now she was in poverty and bankrupt. Then you add, so you add the financial strain on top of the physical strain, and this made her situation even more difficult. All her money was out of her pocket and in the physician's pockets. The doctors cost her everything she had. Not much has changed because healthcare still puts many people in the poorhouse. And we see that physicians weren't cheap in Christ's day either. As a result of seeing all these doctors and getting all their treatments and spending all this money, she was not helped at all. Mark wrote that she was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. And during many disappointments with the doctor, she did not improve, she was not helped or healed, and she only got worse as well as poor. This is not an advertisement for the first century Galilean Medical Association because they didn't help her at all. Luke, who was a doctor himself, wrote in his gospel of this account that this woman could not be healed. So there was no hope for her ever becoming better or ceremonially clean. Mark 5, 27 to 29 reads, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed 
of that plague. This woman had heard the reports in Galilee of Christ's healings and his kindness. She then decided to find him, believing that he could deliver her from her incurable ailment. She had learned about the Lord's return from Decapolis, and she made the bold choice to violate the acceptable boundaries of the law and her uncleanness. And she goes to the beach, and she stands on the fringe of the crowd. She had no money, no clout, no solutions. She was a penniless outcast, and all she had was hope and faith that Christ could help. Mark tells us here of her inner dialogue with herself, and that in her faith she had said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Because she was ceremonially unclean and would be condemned for touching Christ, or for even being in and around this crowd, she decided to do this secretly. She did not say to herself, If I ask him, he will heal me. She decided to not openly ask the Lord to be healed, but instead she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I know I will be made well. She believed that since Christ's touch healed people, if she touched him, she would get the same result. As Christ arrived on the seashore, he was surrounded by people. Jairus, an important man in her community, then begged the Lord to come to his home. As the crowd begins to move, she knows she would have to rub up against people, and who knows how many, defiling them all. But she also knew that her disease was not contagious, so it was not dangerous for anyone for her to do so. She could have said, look, he's going with Jairus. I can't bother him right now. She could have argued that nothing else had helped her, so why try again? And she might have worried that someone might recognize me in this crowd and call out that she was making them all unclean and embarrassing her in front of all these people. But she laid aside all these arguments, obstacles, and excuses that might have made her hesitate or stop. And she came by faith to Christ. She decided to take the chance to risk it. Because of the size of the crowd, she hoped to avoid notice, and with a strong and a desperate faith, she came in among the people by stealth. She snuck her way in, and then she pushed and worked her way through the tightly compressed throng of people from behind to get to the Lord. She let nothing stand in her way, and she finally reached Christ, and as soon as she was close enough, she bent low to the ground, and she lunged and reached out and grabbed the bottom of his cloak. Luke says she touched the border of his garment. Matthew stated that she touched the hem of his garment. The word touched means to fasten oneself to, to adhere to, to cling to. It was a desperate grasping. She did that with all kinds of thoughts swirling in her mind about being where she shouldn't be, contaminating people, but she did it with hope that if she could just reach out and grab that robe just for a moment, she fully believed she would be made whole, and the healing was instantaneous. As soon as the woman's fingers contacted that robe, she immediately felt the sudden rush of vitality flow through her body. Immediately the flow of blood stopped, the hemorrhage was dried up, and she knew and felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. What 12 years of medical appointments and treatments by doctors could not cure, the power of God healed in a split second. Time froze. The world stood still for her in that moment. Her physical problem was gone. In a moment of time, 12 years of chronic bleeding, baffled doctors, shunning family and neighbors, suddenly and completely ended. All she did was extend her arm through the crowd. And with that small 
What courageous gesture of faith. She experienced Christ's tender power and healing. Her faith wasn't in clothing. This was not superstition about a robe. It was about faith in the power, provision, and mercy found in the person of Jesus Christ. I visited Israel in 2018. Being there for the first time, I had many special moments knowing I was where our Lord walked on this earth and ministered to Israel. One unexpected moment for me was when we visited a church on the Sea of Galilee. It had a boat for a pulpit, which as a pastor I found very interesting. But when we went downstairs in this church, and we came around the corner, there was this beautiful, moving picture on the wall of the account that we are looking at. And I just stood there, stunned by it, staring at it for a while, thinking about this account, thinking about the faith that led this woman to reach through the crowd to touch the hem of our Lord's garment. Then it dawned on me that the location of this church, this picture, I was on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, very near where this event actually took place, and that blew me away. The next year, on a tour I co-led, I had the special opportunity to share a devotion with the group about this amazing story with this picture right behind me. Mark 5, 30 to 34 reads, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. Immediately this woman was healed. Immediately Christ felt the power go out of him. And immediately he stopped. God honors radical faith. As it's been said, when an ark was built, lives were saved. When soldiers marched, Jericho tumbled. When a staff was raised, a sea opened. When a lunch was shared, thousands were fed. And when a garment was touched by the hand of an anemic woman in Galilee, Christ stops. Faith stops the Lord. Christ distinguished between the touch of the crowd and the agonized touch of a needy soul by faith from one who needed his help. One commentator put it well that this woman had begun with fact. The Lord's power was so absolute. He was so mighty to save that a touch would do. Even a touch of his robe, even a touch of its hem. Fact had been followed by faith. She came, she touched, it worked. It was faith, her personal faith in Christ that distinguished her from all of the others who thronged him. They touched him too, but nothing happened to them. Even today, many people brush up against him, but they go away the same as they came. Christ stopped, turned around, and he asked, who touched my garments? He didn't ask the question for information. He knew what had happened and who had touched him. She knows she's been healed. He knows she's been healed. But everybody else in that crowd did not know. The Lord asked the question to bring the woman out of her hiding, to draw her out, because he wanted to do something special for her. Initially, no one admitted they had touched the Lord. Luke adds that everybody was denying it. It wasn't me. It makes me imagine in my mind people looking around and people pointing at other people and some nodding their heads to the person next to them. 
The woman intended to remain incognito and to allow the crowd to just pass on, hoping to shrink back unnoticed from the crowd and then return to her home in a normal life. The disciples respond to the Lord's question, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? Or with all these people pressing in all around you on all sides, it would be easier to answer, Who hasn't touched you? The Lord continued then to look all around at the faces in the crowd. In verse 32, literally means he looked penetratingly into the crowd. He scanned the crowd, looking and searching for her, looking from one side to the other with a searching gaze. The question of what one person touched the Lord when all kinds of people touched him as they walked, and what separated one face from all the other faces in that crowd as Christ was searching for her was one thing, faith. It was not just the miracle that Christ wanted to make public. It was the woman's faith. Only one person in that throng of people knew why he asked, who touched my clothes? And she froze in her tracks. The woman had not expected or wanted to be detected, but when Christ turned and asked the question, she knew that he knew. The woman remained silent at first. Upon being detected, she was seized with a feeling of fear, and the trembling that resulted showed itself visibly. And finally, she stepped forward and revealed that it was her. Fearing and trembling, knowing she was in the presence of God, she came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. She explained what he knew how she had suffered for 12 years with her infirmity, how she had lost all her money to doctors trying to find a cure, how she believed that just touching his garment she would be made whole, and that when she did grab his garment, she had been healed and cured immediately. In her fear and trembling at that moment, she may have expected a rebuke, but instead she heard words of kindness flowing from a heart full of compassion and love, and Christ called the woman daughter. He called her by a term of family endearment. She had been separated from her family, and Christ calls her by a family term out of his love, and it is the only time in the Gospels that Christ called any woman, daughter. Imagine how that made her feel. Who could remember the last time she received and heard a term of affection? It's been said to the loved, a word of affection is a morsel, a small bite. But to the love starved, a word of affection can be a feast. And Christ gave this woman a banquet. Christ commended her faith in him because that was what was most often missing when people came to him. He wanted Israel to see this humble woman who crawled in under the vision of everybody, grabbed his robe, fully believing that in doing so she would be healed. But Christ called this woman forward to commend her faith, but also for her sake going forward. Luke 8 says, She declared unto him before all the people. Everybody heard her story in that crowd. It would have taken time for her on her own to convince people that after 12 years she was fully healed and not unclean anymore. Having her declare her healing with the Lord affirming it before this great crowd, he wanted the people in that community to know that she was now healed, she was clean, she should be fully welcomed back into life in Israel. She had been restored back to health, restored back to society, restored back to her family, restored back to the worship of God. 
The Lord then sent her off with a final blessing of assurance, go in peace. She had lived a hard life for 12 years and knew anything but peace. But now everything was new and she could now go in peace and live in the peace and comfort of her healing and wholeness with her disease no longer troubling her and gone. After this account, the funny thing is that many more did what this woman did. Mark 6, after this account, 56 tells us, And with whithersoever he entered, into villages or cities or country, they besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment, and as many as touched him were made whole. This woman started something. This anonymous, nameless woman had been perpetually unclean, unable to fix the problem herself. No physician could help her. She couldn't buy her healing. She was bankrupt. She saw Christ as her only option. She went to him in faith, and then by a miracle of power, mercy, and grace, Christ took her uncleanness away. And in all of that, you find a picture of salvation. This anonymous woman stands as a picture of all people because because of our sins, each of us is unclean perpetually, unable to fix the problem ourselves. No physician can help this spiritual problem. We can't buy our way out of it. And sin leaves us spiritually bankrupt. Christ is the only option. We must go to him in faith. And those who come to him in faith and desperation to be saved from all their sins are treated by the Lord as he did with this woman, with kindness and with love. And under grace today, just believing that Christ died for your sins and rose again, in that moment, he instantly makes us whole. And he takes our uncleanness away by a miracle of his power, mercy, and grace. And after our cleansing, we too are told by Christ, go in peace. Live in the peace, the comfort, and the blessing of our wholeness in him. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, Write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.